Newsmaker Sunday with Fox 10's John Hook. Thanks for joining us on Newsmaker Sunday. We're going to cover three topics this week on Newsmaker Sunday. First, the teacher strike. Then we're going to bring in Congressman Tom O'Halloran, CD1 from Arizona. That's the eastern side all the way north through the reservations, almost to the border of Arizona, to the top of the border. And then we're going to uh, show you again my interview with Vice President Mike Pence earlier this week when he was in Tempe touting the Trump tax cuts. But let's begin with Red for Ed. And we'll take a look at the video, which was just staggering. When you look at that phalanx of people moving through downtown Phoenix, heading for the state capitol, it was impressive. It's something we've never seen before in this state. That size march estimates somewhere between 50 and 75,000 people. Teachers walked out of schools for a week protesting low pay, slumping education funding. They returned to class on Friday, marking an end to the biggest teacher strike in Arizona history. The state is going to give teachers a 20% raise by 2020, also investing an additional $138 million in schools. An outcome that frankly only partially meets the educators' demands. And they're promising that they will have their voices heard in November. Doug Ducey, Governor Doug Ducey, signed the new bill into law 6, 10 a.m. on Thursday morning. This is a real win for our teachers, for our kids, for our educators in the classroom. And uh, we're grateful for your help in getting this over the finish line. We're excited that it's a bipartisan bill and uh, it's time to do this. So uh, it's a good way to start the day. That was Governor Doug Ducey on Thursday morning signing the bill into law. But reaction was swift from teachers, the Red for Ed movement, and I think it's important to hear from them because they certainly got something here, but they are not satisfied. That is clear. Take a listen. It passed, but it's not enough. It's just not enough. Our students deserve better. Did you get everything you guys were asking for? Nothing. <laughs> no. I think it was described well when it was that they, there are five demands and they did not even get part of one. So, it is a fight that will certainly go on in Arizona. Education funding is something our guest knows about because he was down at the Arizona legislature before becoming congressman from Arizona Congressional District 1. Tom O'Halloran, Democrat, joining us again on Newsmaker Sunday. Great to see you. Your reaction to this Red for Ed groundswell that happened here in the state. Well, I appreciate being here, John. I, I think it, it was time for it. Uh, sadly, uh, we, our teachers had to go on strike or get out of school in order to do this. Uh, we should have seen it coming. Uh, our, our schools have been uh, underfunded uh, for years. And it's not just teacher salaries. It's, a, it's the salaries of those that are not teachers. It's the nurses. It's the librarians. It's not having enough people to help the classroom teachers. It's the upkeep of our schools. You know, when I came into the legislature, we were $2 billion behind on upkeep. They are heading in that direction now. And when they only put a hundred and some thousand million dollars into it, that, that is not going to get us where we need to be. And we're looking at, I think we're heading to a ballot initiative, no doubt, because they can't, you know, I just stated it, they can't just write a check for that right now. They just don't have it. You have to have funding source that's sustainable. And the only way we're going to do it is through a ballot measure, I think. Do you like the ballot measure that's being talked about, about taxing basically the 1%? Any individual making over $250,000, their income tax in the state would almost double. A family, a two breadwinners, joint income, 500000 and above, theirs would definitely double. What do you think? Well, I haven't done the analysis on that. It just occurred. But uh, I'll, I, I can say this. We have to find the money somewhere. Would you favor we, sales tax instead? In our, well, I, I would favor a combination maybe. But we have to remember our families are still stressed out from this economic downturn that we had. Our, our farmers in this state and across America are, have been struggling for five years. These teachers that were marching in the streets, many of them didn't get raises year after year mm -hmm. after year. And the working people of America have not gotten a pay raise for a long time. Since you were down there, you were down there in the, down, in the downturn. How dire was it trying to balance the state budget in that economic environment? Well, I got, uh, when I first got elected, we were in a downturn also. And we had to cut about a billion dollars out uh, across the entire budget. And we prioritized. Uh, they were in a different situation, but from 10 to 13, they didn't do anything. From 13 to 15, they didn't do anything. And, and when you do that, 
and the teachers are struggling and we're losing teachers left and right and we know the schools aren't being maintained at the proper level this is what this is the outcome of this government has to be more proactive one more thing and we'll move on to all of your stuff in Washington do you believe that this would have happened without this groundswell in this movement not at all I, th I think the the grassroots support that this has not only amongst teachers but across the entire state of Arizona I haven't gone to a meeting yet there people look at me and say they should never have, uh, get this money you mentioned something just a m moment ago that I know you've been involved with and I had not read a thing about this farmers mm -hmm. the suicide rate among farmers is off the chart you've had hearings on this you've talked yes. about this yes. suicide rates off the chart uh, the imp impact on families through you know the farmers have to take out loans they have to be able to repay those loans prices of crops have not been where they need to be the tariff situation is not helping us right now because we have a green the beef industry uh, does ten billion dollars a year over in china uh, we we need these markets open for our farmers and to you're survive. in a rural district in arizona so you know about this and i just was not aware of it frankly that this was an issue out there yeah and, and that's you know, we, have, we have a lot of issues out there it's hard to, for everybody to know every issue uh, but when people are dying, when families are going bankrupt, uh, when, when families aren't al allowed, that feed America, are not allowed to be able to survive uh, in, that <coughs> excuse me, in that environment, this is what happens. Okay, let me, uh, <coughs> let me move on to something else. There are so many issues happening right now, but the tinder fire right. is, is, in your, is in your area. Um, let's show you some <coughs> of this burning north of, of Payson uh, on the rim country. How do you feel we are managing our forests right now? How big of an issue? Well, we, we, it was a terrible issue because we weren't funding it. These fires were being taken, the funding was coming out of the Forest Service budget. Right. And so every, every district, every area in the Forest Service couldn't get the uh, thinning that was required done or the studies that were needed for NEPA done in a timely manner. So we put a, a few billion dollars into that to make sure that we have funding for fires and then the forest have enough funding for uh, addressing the other. You know, historically, before we did all this fire suppression, fires would start, <clears throat> lightning or otherwise, and they would burn. And it was a naturally occurring way to kind of regenerate the forest. We've gotten so into fire suppression, I wonder if we've created some of these problems. Oh, there's no doubt suppression has hurt. Uh, you go to the tree ring studies at the U of A or ask Wally Covington at AAU. He's, um, he's amazing. He is. And uh, I've worked with them a lot. And uh, you can see where the, this a tree has been burnt time and time and time again. But it was become, because crown fires couldn't get there because w the areas around those trees were clear. Right. Now they're full of growth. Uh, but I can tell you this. I was up at the, uh, the fire the other day. And uh, I saw, what I saw there was some great decisions made early on that saved those subdivisions. What did they do? Tell me. Well, they, 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 they took attacked a, it quickly. They, they, well, they took a 50-acre fire and made a decision early on that they needed to get a type 1 team on the ground, a management team. They, then they settled a, place, a, a line in place and said, if it goes past here, we're going to have to evacuate. Even before it went past there and those winds picked up, uh, the Coconino County Sheriff stepped in and evacuated the area. Mm -hmm. And I, I know from the firefighters that they think that was the best evacuations they had ever seen. Oh, no kidding. And I think the decision to, at the 50-acre level saved subdivisions. Not to, Even we though we lost a we fair were, amount uh, of homes. Sad. I, I saw those houses. But we would have lost whole subdivisions. Let me move on to a couple of things that are happening in the news. Uh, the Navajo Generating Station, you've been fighting to, to try to save that. It's interesting to see Democrats rally around coal when usually Democrats are against burning coal because of environmental reasons. Is there an incongruity here? Well, I, I think we need to both address the economic conditions in that area and address the reality of the, of, of the plant. But coal generation, when it was going to meet the standards as set by the government, well, then they were going to meet those standards. But, you know, if they couldn't, we've seen over 200 coal generation plants go out of business. There's a natural progression here going on. It's a cost factor. So you're not trying to stop what's naturally occurring. You can't. It's an economic, uh, that would be like me stepping in and starting putting regulations on an environment uh, where 
uh, you do business on one side of the street and you, you're a competitor on the other side, I'm only going to put a condition on you. So could that's you wrong. make a case that it shouldn't be safe, let economic forces at work Well, that's what they're out. doing. The ec economic forces are doing that. We have private investors potentially looking at if they can find customers for, for the plant. Uh, we have the uh, Peabody Cold trying to find a, a way to get cold prices lower. Uh, but I, I, in talking to most of the experts, uh, it looks like that, that's maybe a, an undoable process. But in the native lands, this is one of the yeah. great economic engines there, right? This employs a lot of people. It's devastating. Hopi, over 80% of their general fund comes from the revenue sources from the, the, this coal. So the coal. if it were to disappear, what, how would you make up that revenue? Well, what we're doing is trying to find ways of, of economic development, whether it's alternative fuels, because some of those transmission lines will be transferred over to the Navajo government. Uh, Hopi, uh, we're trying to find ways for them to uh, either uh, be able to uh, sell their coal somewhere else, that, a plant that's right. open. But again, y y this is a national trend, and, and, and this is a trend that, that is not going to stop because of the pricing. So when the president talked about we are going, coal is going to come back, you just don't buy it. It's just not happening. Take a look at the results after a year and a half. And we, we have plants all over the America closing still. Let me ask you about North Korea. And I asked the vice president about that, and it's coming up uh, shortly here on the program. How, this is North and South meeting. This was just a remarkable image. Look at this. I mean, who would have ever thought this was going to happen? Mm -hmm. A, does President Trump deserve some credit for this? And B, are you hopeful about the outcome of a summit between President Trump and North Korean President Kim Jong-un? Or do you think we're walking into a trap? Well, anybody that helps bring that together where those two sides shake hands, uh, that's an important step forward. Uh, and, uh, and the president should be able to take some of the uh, acknowledgement of that. Uh, I think going forward, though, the idea that North Korea uh, is said they're going to stop research and tear down their sites doesn't mean they're going to stop production, especially of the missiles and the uh, atomic warheads. So when they say we're, gonna, we're going to stop testing, it's possible that they've done all the testing they need. Sure is. They're not talking about getting rid of the warheads they have. No, not at this point. We'll see what the negotiations bring forward. A president after president have gone down this path with North Korea only to find out that after a couple years and they get their economy back going, uh, that it all falls apart. Vice President Pence told me that they are clear-eyed on this, that if they don't get that, the sanctions ratchet up even more. Well, and I think they should. I, I think we have to take a tough stance with North Korea. There's no doubt about it. We cannot allow them to have nuclear weapons that atta can attack America. First term. Congressman Tom O'Halloran, Democrat from uh, Congressional District 1, just to uh, let you know, it is the 10th largest district in the country, stretching from Tucson east of Phoenix all the way up uh, through Pine Top, Holbrook, Flagstaff, Hopi, Navajo Nations. It is a massive district. Back with Congressman O'Halloran on Newsmaker Sunday right after this. Arizona Congressman, freshman Congressman, running for a second term, Tom O'Halloran, a Democrat from uh, District 1, 10th largest district in the country, stretching from Tucson at the south end, north and east of Phoenix. It kind of skirts Phoenix in a, in a reverse C, um, heading up to Pine Top, Holbrook, Flagstaff, the Hopi and Navajo Nations. It leans slightly Republican by two percentage points. And by the way, it is one of only 12 districts won by President Trump in 2016, where there's a Democrat in the House seat in the district. And You're one I, of them. And I, 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 pull, I got 5% more votes than Mr. Trump. How do you pull that off? Work. You work hard. You stay competitive, no matter what the situation. If you see a, a poll that says you're up by 15, try to get to 20. You were a Republican when you were at the state legislature. I was, yeah. And I'm trying to remember what you had on your desk down there. You told I me didn't have anything on my desk. Everybody had a, a elephant, elephant or a donkey. Elephant or a donkey. You had nothing on your desk. That's the desk of the people of Arizona, I said. You wear that proudly. I do. This defines you as a politician? I think it does. An independent mind. Well, the, I, I'm independent to the t point where I vote my district. I don't vote for what somebody thinks I should vote. 
It's the reality of what my district is facing. Leadership never comes to you and says, Tom, we need you on this. Doesn't bother me. They, they, uh, they haven't come up to my seat one time. Does it affect your ability to gain clout in the House because you don't necessarily play ball? Well, I've had a very good year. I mean, uh, you take a look at the budget and its impact on Arizona Congressional District 1. It's tremendous, and more is coming out. We've got new schools for the Navajo. We, we've been able to develop a, a hospital staff for the uh, Gila. We've been able to get enterprise-type zones throughout uh, the area. Uh, that, I was a co-sponsor of those bills. I, we've put $2 billion into broadband. Uh, I could go on and on. Should Nancy Pelosi still be speaker? I mean, if, she, if you guys were to win in November, should she be the speaker? I think she's going to have to prove herself, and, and I think she's going to have a, definitely a number of competitors in that process. Is there someone else you'd rather see? I want to see their, their platform. Uh, I, I, I know what her platform is. I know what her fundraising capabilities are. Uh, we don't agree on many things, uh, but uh, there's some really qualified people out there. Is there a sense that the Democratic Party has lost touch with the working man and woman in this country? Well, I know I haven't. I, I, my dad was a janitor. <laughs> and so uh, when we said... You know this has been discussed oh, widely. Oh, yeah in the wake of 2016. I, I think if we don't get the message of 2016 uh, that, that we were paying too much attention to other things, but when you get down to it and you look at history, uh, we are the party that has helped the working people me, of America. Let me ask you a couple of other issues. The Iran nuclear deal. The president has said we got absolutely screwed, to use the, the, the word, uh, in this deal. It's a bad deal. We need to dump it. The Allies are saying, other than Israel, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. We don't really have any other way to peer into what they're doing. If you walk away from this thing, now we've lost all touch with what they're doing in Iran. What is your take on this deal and what should be done? I think we should keep the deal. Uh, I think we need to, those inspectors in country. I think we need to, the, the combination of all of our allies to be able to uh, address these issues. And if we le left the table without our allies working with us, to do that, uh, then how are they going to look at us in the future? So we need to, to keep our word. Secondly, though, we need to be very firm with Iran and put sanctions on them for their terrorism uh, funding, uh, for their expansion of their missile program, for the idea that they want to become the controlling factor of the Middle East. Uh, this cannot be allowed. Okay. Budget deal signed. A trillion dollars again. You voted for it. Nope. I voted, voted against, the against the budget. Right. And it wasn't a trillion. At the time, it was $1.5 trillion. And we were told uh, by the administration... Look at this thing. It's a monstrosity. <laughs> yeah. we got it. They wanted us to look at it in two days and vote on it. Uh, the the admi administration said, don't worry about it. We're going to be able to pay that with a growing economy. The next words out of the administration after this passed were, well, the bu bu budget uh, hit is going to be actually $1.8 trillion. And now it's uh, $2 trillion. And it's going to go on. This you will not be paid against up. it. I, I, can, because, I can't fiscally, vote for something like that. I want it, well, also because the middle class of America were not getting, they got 17% of, of, of the uh, benefits for only seven years. And while corporate America, which was flush with cash, I agreed with taking cash back from foreign countries and any break we can do to get investment back in, in our country. But something of this scale, uh, during this time in our country's history, we didn't do the infrastructure bill for a reason. Uh, you know, so and next, next year is going to be a harder battle because of this. Yeah, and the president has promised that as well. Tom O'Halloran, great to see you. Same here. And uh, good luck in the fall, and we will have you back on Newsmaker Sunday. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Okay, you got it. We'll be back in a moment with Vice President Mike Pence. Welcome back to Newsmaker Sunday. Again, thanks to uh, Congressman Tom O'Halloran for joining us this week. We want to conclude with my interview with Vice President Mike Pence. He was in Arizona this week to tout President Trump's tax cuts at an event in Tempe. Uh, Mike Pence and my conversation here on Newsmaker Sunday. I know you met with Governor Ducey. I have to ask you about the teacher strike going sure. on in Arizona because it's an issue you dealt with in Indiana. It's an issue that affects 29 states right now. What's your take on what's happening here? Well, first and foremost, I'm not just a vice president, but I've been married to a school teacher <laughs> for more than 30 years. My wife spent 25 years in the classroom, and I know just like Governor Ducey, just like President Trump, we, we hold our teachers in the highest regard. I mean, Arizona and America have some of the 
greatest men and women in our classrooms. And uh, I'm just very confident uh, that uh, with his proposal for a 20 percent pay raise for teachers by 2020, that Governor Ducey is going to be able to move past uh, this issue and move forward. But uh, President Trump and I truly do believe that education is a state and local function. Uh, and we're very confident here in Arizona and other places around the country that these issues will be worked out in a way that reflects the high regard that every American holds our teachers in the classroom. Let me ask you about North Korea. Are you concerned that expectations about what might happen in a summit with Kim Jong-un are kind of outstripping what is deliverable? Are you worried that expectations are getting too high for what may come of this? I'm very confident that, uh, that the strong economic sanctions and the clear stand that President Trump has taken regarding the regime in North Korea has brought us to this point. I mean, bringing, literally bringing the world community together, isolating North Korea economically and diplomatically as never before. We, we not only have allies joining us in, in economic sanctions and pressure, but China has engaged mm -hmm. in supporting our efforts as never before. And I, I think also the fact that the president's made it very clear that we, we will not accept uh, the regime in North Korea possessing nuclear weapons that threaten the United States. So if he goes down, that, that's a non-starter. If, if he is not going to. I think the president's made it very clear. Our objective is denuclearization. And from very early on, the president has stated that all options are on the table. And we brought unprecedented economic pressure to bear. But all of that, we, we come into this hopeful. Uh, we've seen some encouraging signs. Uh, by the regime in North Korea, that they've, they've taken steps to, to cease nuclear testing, to cease ballistic missile testing. Uh, and the recent summit between the North and South creates a hopeful background. But I, I can assure, I can assure you uh, that President Trump is going to go into this clear-eyed, with clear expectations. Uh, and, and if the Kim regime is willing to take permanent, verifiable, and irreversible steps to abandon their nuclear and ballistic missile program, then and only then will the United States consider diverting from the extreme pressure campaign that we've put on them. You mentioned the caravan today coming from Central America. Do we as a, as a nation uh, that honors immigrants as well, do we have an obligation to those folks? And the claims of asylum, can you verify them? I'm very confident that our customs and border personnel uh, will process uh, those and any other asylum claims consistent with American law, and that's already beginning to take place today. But, but let's, let's make no mistake about it. Um, these families and other families that are being brought from Central America, traveling thousands of miles at great risk to themselves and often with vulnerable families and vulnerable children are, are being exploited. They're being exploited by organizations that are attempting to use these families to force change in America's immigration laws. And it's the reason why we, we need to build the wall. It's the reason why we need to close the loopholes that serve as a magnet for people to be enticed to make that long journey to the north. We're, we're a nation of immigrants. Uh, in, in so many ways. My grandfather immigrated to this country, but it, we're a nation of legal immigration, and President Trump and I are absolutely committed to see to it that, that we reaffirm our commitment to our borders, that we reform our laws in ways that will close these dangerous loopholes, uh, and then, and then uh, and we'll be able to extend uh, the welcome mat of this country under the rule of law as we always have. One more thing. You you are one of the more thoughtful, diligent, careful guys that I've watched over the years. I mean that as a compliment. Thank you, Jim. Is it tough at times to reconcile that with your boss and some of the stuff he does? Do you think that it gets in the way of the message, what you're trying to get out there? It's the greatest honor of my life to serve as vice president uh, to President Donald Trump. And, and while our styles are different, our backgrounds are different, our cause is the same. And what I see this president do every single day is get up in the morning and drive forward to keep the promises that he made to the people of Arizona and the people of this country. I think it's one of the reasons why you've seen 3 million jobs created, 85,000 new jobs here in Arizona. It's the reason why we've been able to cut taxes, roll back regulations, rebuild our military, because this president, I believe, is, is the right man at the right time to bring this country back. And it's my great honor to serve with him. Mr.
Mr. Vice President, appreciate your time. Thank Great you, to John. see you. Vice President Mike Pence here in the Valley earlier this week to talk about President Trump's tax cuts. That's it for Fox 10 Newsmaker Sunday. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.